Hello there, today I'm going to be talking about this book, Flights by Olga Tokarczuk, uh, published in Polish in 2007 and then 10 years later in English, uh, translated by Jennifer Croft. As you can see, it won the Man Booker International Prize and uh, Tokarczuk is also the winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature. So um, yeah, I kind of had some high expectations for this one. And uh, yeah, my, well, let me tell you about the book first of all. It's uh, it's written as a sort of like series of vignettes uh, or musings and observations. Sometimes those are only like one page or a, a paragraph. Um, and then sometimes the longer pieces are actually like fictional short stories, um, which can be to 20 to 30 pages. So sometimes like kind of big chunks of this. The whole thing uh, is about 400 pages and it's got kind of small uh, font, but also these, like I said, uh, since it's broken into lots of small sections, like you can see here, there's often like big gaps there. So it's kind of hard to tell how long it really was. You've got uh, a kind of common theme running through, as you can tell from the title, Flights, although it's a different title in Polish. Um, but the theme is basically travel and... Uh, I guess, yeah, travel, modern day travel. So, you know, like airplanes and stuff. But it's kind of stretched quite a bit far into sort of like a very vague and quasi philosophical sometimes philosophical but like lots of times just quite vague idea of what travel means so for example there's a lot on anatomy um, which is really great there's a lot of short stories to do with anatomists like this Dutch anatomist from the 16 or 1700s um, he gets his own short story and you know it's just brilliant. It made me really interested in um, Dutch anatomy from that time period, like anatom anatomists, not anatomy, not like how what Dutch people are made up of. But um, it was just like, like it made me want to write a historical biography. Like the, her her writing skill was so superb, and not not just like her choice of words and so on, but like her plotting. Like she's obviously like a masterful storyteller. The way that she um, she knows exactly when to put information into a story that will further the plot a bit, like at what part of the paragraph to put in some sort of key bit of information. Like, that's something I really appreciate if a writer knows exactly how to reveal things, and, and she does so well. Um, oh yeah, I just opened to this map thing. There's also uh, very, like, quite rarely, I think there's only 10 in total, but there's little maps interspersed throughout. And sometimes they have a kind of resonance with nearby stories around them and other times they don't. At the end of the book, she has like an index and I thought that she picked out these maps, you know, like from different documents and so on. But apparently they all come from the same book, which is the Agile Rabbit Book of Historical and Curious Maps, published in 2005 by the Pepin Press. So she basically just took this book and took out a bunch of maps and interspersed those maps into her own book because they look interesting I guess. Some of the maps are really great like I really this, this is near the end um, this is uh, like a Victorian map of the the journeys of Odysseus so that's like the Greece and then that's like the ocean and then there's like the world and then there's like the river surrounding the world so, so like most of them are real maps not fantasy ones. Also a bunch of Chinese maps which I feel like may have been included because you know like the the interest of looking at calligraphy on top, like as place markers, is something that she comes up, she comes to at a few points in her in her book, and and that's something which is a bit questionable, and like I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute, but there's one bit where the I, the the narrator, um, says that her favorite uh, books are one some kind of what was it like medieval encyclopedia, I think or medieval sort of factual manuscript, but it's got like all sorts of weird magical stuff in it. And the other one was Moby Dick. And I think that this, like, this book reminds me a lot of Moby Dick in the way that it takes its theme and then has this sort of like encyclopedic style of, you know, just listing different things and taking different perspectives around this one theme. Um, the other book that it really reminded me of was Italo Calvino's If on a Winter's Night a Traveller, because that book has, um, again, a theme of, the theme of that book is the beginnings of stories, or beginning openings, right? Like, the thing that, like, makes you attracted to a book, like, in terms of, like, a, a hook, right? Like, a narrative hook. And so that book is written with chapters, um, 
first of all, like beginnings of stories, short stories, and then those chapters are interspersed with uh, an I story. Or actually, it's a you story, yeah, it's second person, but about, you know, just a sort of normal person who's going around buying the books and trying to read the stories that are there. So that, like, interspersing of a narrator sort of just observing, you know, normal life, and then also having these really engaging beginnings of stories and fragments of stories, uh, that reminded me a lot of... Uh, if on a winter's night of tra uh, if on a winter's night a traveler, um, but the difference I think between both Moby Dick and If on a Winter's Night, those books both had like a really clear uh, theme, really clear theme. One is like whales and whaling, and there's also a clear plot. They're like on an adventure to to catch a whale, right? Um, and then in the other one, it's like it's about beginnings of stories, and it sounds vague, but I think it sticks to that pretty well. And in this one, like. The idea of flights, although again, like that's not the original title, but the idea of travel, let's say, um, is stretched so far that it kind of just seems really sometimes like it's being being stretched a bit too far. You know what I mean? So like in one of these stories, like about the halfway point, she has this one called this section called Travel Tales. She says, am I doing the right thing by telling stories? Um, and she basically says that, you know, should she be writing this in a series of lectures or like footnotes or like essays or like, you know, how, what is the best way to do it? Is fiction really the way that she wants to write this? And this, this fact that like halfway through the book, she's sort of saying like, should I even be writing this book? Like, to be honest, I think that comes through all the way through this sort of uncertainty and like lack of confidence in her, her main theme, which, um, and I, I guess it's intentional, um, you know, but for me, it honestly, it kind of hurts it. She says here, like, it's as if I'm taking on the role of midwife or of the tender of a garden whose only merit is at best sowing seeds and later to fight tediously against weeds. So, you know, like she's saying, if you know, if you write it in, in lectures and essays, then you have control basically of your argument. But writing in stories, then you've got these weeds that come in and you're just sort of like giving birth to a fiction and you don't really have so much control over, you know, like tidying up the loose ends and so on. But I mean, I would disagree because... Um, you know, like I said, Moby Dick, If on a Winter's Night a Traveler, other writers can do it. And it does feel like there are some weeds in this book that like the writer and the reader has to sort of fight tediously against. Also, having just read that, that example, like the metaphors in this book, I want to talk about that because if you really like the use of metaphors, then I think you will like this book more. Um, I am not so keen generally on metaphors and similes, you know, like, I mean, they're everywhere. It's not like I don't read books with metaphors in them. It's just that, like, she uses them so much and, like, sometimes in the most ridiculous ways. So here's one where she's describing, uh, this is in the middle of a fictional story about uh, a wife describing her husband, who is a professor, and she's talking about how, you know, amazing it is that he can fit so much knowledge in his head. And this is how she describes it. She says, it was clear that such an enormous stock of knowledge could not be put in order. It had instead the form of a sponge, of deep-sea corals growing over years until they started to create the most fantastic forms. This was knowledge that had already attained critical mass and had since crossed over into some other state. It appeared to reproduce, to multiply, to organize in complex and binary forms. Associations traveled down unusual routes. Likenesses were found in the least expected versions like kinship in Brazilian soap operas, where anyone could turn out to be the child or husband or sister of anybody else. That bit made me laugh out loud. And I, I think it's supposed to be a bit funny um, that she's using, you know, like, she's just basically, you know, using this, these images of deep sea corals and Brazilian soap operas to say, this guy's really smart, right? I find like the metaphors like this are both sometimes amazing, like, and annoying. Because this one is, I like it. Overall, I liked it. Like I said, it gave me a, it gave me a laugh, and I was just really shocked to suddenly like see Brazilian soap operas like yanked into this description and and done in a pretty good way. I thought. And there's other metaphors like in the same story and throughout the book, which are really brilliant, like extended similes. Um, in this one, there's one about like uh, someone dying and uh, blood flooding their brain, and she describes the blood as like an ocean of blood, like kind of washing away all of that person's. Uh, memories and experiences throughout their life so you know like you'll have like the cities and the hotels and that the person has lived in and like just slowly being submerged in blood and you know until there's only like a few little things left um, and then of course it's all gone and the person is dead and um, I thought it was so moving and brilliantly written so there's loads of examples of similes which I thought were 
brilliant ideas. Um, there's another one about a, a plastic bag where she's talking about the plastic bag as though it's a species, as though it's an invasive species. Um, so she uses very much like an ecological terminology to talk about how like the plastic bag has moved from habitat to habitat and like how long lived it is, how it reproduces and all these things. And it's, it's quite convincing and done in only in a really short section. So some of those extended similes are great. Some of them I think like go a bit too far and especially when it comes to the main theme, uh, again, like some, you can make anything parallel with anything else if you use metaphors enough, right? So anything can be about travel. Like one of the main things in this book that she writes about is actually anatomy. And so there's lots of amazing descriptions of the human body. And that's, you know, a takeaway point from this book, I think. Um, but to, do, to connect that to the theme, she's often talking about, you know, like traveling through the body and, you know, the, the, the journey of, of a pilgrim to discover, you know, the, you know, like what connects one tendon to another tendon. And it's not like there's anything wrong with, you know, describing anatomy as a form of travel or as a form of, you know, like flight, but it's, I don't know, some, especially towards the end, I feel like it's really like struggling to connect all these disparate things where really she should have just written a book about anatomy and then like had a separate travel diary you know and then like publish them both because they'd both be good i would prefer the anatomy one um but you know that's obviously not the project that she set out to do um but yeah unfortunately i just feel the bits don't they don't all gel together the form does kind of follow the content in some ways because there's there's this bit at the beginning um where she talks about uh what's it called like cabinets of curiosities, um, or or not museums, but you know those kind of like, uh, like kind of museums of oddities, antiques and oddities, right? And there's a special word, but I'm forgetting it. But anyway, she talks about going through them and how they've got these assortment of weird objects, you know, this uh, this way that is like kind of unofficial culture gathering, you no, know, as opposed to museums, you no, know, which is obviously official. And the the sort of the sense of going through all these odd bits of assorted materials. And having that wonderful feeling of, you know, what brings them together in this strange space. And I kind of, she didn't say it directly, but I do feel like that's kind of what she's going for with the form of this novel. That she wants to have disparate things in it, like anatomy and airplanes and so on. Um, and that she wants them to feel like they're connected. Not necessarily because they're all underneath some overarching theme, but because there's uh, like this like kind of atmosphere that you generate by putting them alongside each other, you know, and yeah, like how she decided, you know, how to order this must be, must have been like, an, I guess like a really difficult undertaking. Um, but I don't really, I don't really feel it, to be honest. It definitely feels less like a cabinet of curiosities to me and more just like a writer's journal and a very specific writer's journal. There's definitely like the, the sense of a person in this. And that's like another thing. The narrator of this book, like especially at the beginning, sort of paints himself as a, uh, she paints herself, I should say, as a nomad, as someone who is uh, like addicted, not addicted, but yeah, I guess addicted in a way to to being mobile, to traveling. Um, and, you know, I presume this is a sort of like fictionalized version of herself, uh, the writer, I mean. But um, she there's a great image where she talks about, I forget the name, I had to look it up, but she says, I'm the anti, and then it's a Greek name, like Antoclus or something. And it was the, the giant that Hercules fought, uh, who got his strength from the earth, um, and that he could only be defeated when Hercules lifted him, so he was no longer connected to the earth. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, the idea that she's the opposite of that, that she needs, she gets her strength from not having connections, being always on the move, being always like kind of taking a plane from here to there to the other place. And um, that's fine. And that's interesting, I guess. But the thing is that that comes across as kind of hypocritical at parts because she's obviously also very rooted in certain identities, right? Like the fact that she is a white, uh, female, Polish middle class writer and you know it's not that there's anything wrong with any of those things right and like it's really interesting for me like reading a lot about like uh polish stuff there's a lot of polish stuff in this right and um like kind of lots of feminist passages as well there's definitely like a sort of groundedness to her identities which does seem to jar with uh, the nomadism and the sort of like the romantic picture of somebody who has no roots and who like thrives off moving around from place to place and not having a sort of strong sense of self so like that contrast could have been really interesting if it had been explored but instead it just seems like i don't know 
like a kind of unresolved tension. And I can't help but feeling that actually it's not intentional at all by the writer and it's just something that she's oblivious of. Like if the, that's what makes it feel autobiographical. I feel like if the narrator was a character, then we would get some like kind of exploration of those, those tensions um, in themselves. But instead, uh, the narrator comes across as pretty naive to me. And that clash between, you know, on the one hand feeling mobility and on the other hand, you know, having a very strong sense of selfhood and nationality and uh, gender and so on is just really underexplored. While I'm on that topic, um, there's also something which really I found quite jarring. And this is related to my own like kind of uh, interests and what I've studied for quite a few years. But there's quite a bit of Orientalism in this book and like kind of exoticization or fetishization of Asia. Kind of like what I said about the Chinese maps. It's like um, she's obviously going for an internationalist vibe with this book. Um, and yet when she talks, you know, there's these descriptions of people who are olive skinned and have darker skinned and, you know, like it's always other, right? Like she doesn't know about like the whiteness or pasty paleness of white people. You know what I mean? Like it's always there's a sense, whether it's implicit or like directly said, of uh, people with darker skin being like kind of a different a different type of person to us, us being the, the narrator and the presumed reader. So there's this bit with the Orientalism. On page 184, she's talking about airports and she talks about Tokyo and being faced with uh, kanji. We haven't mastered the Japanese alphabet. We won't know what our arrival means, with what word they greet us here. What do they stamp into our passport? A big question mark. And it's like the, the thing that's interesting there that jumps out at me is the first person plural, right? Like the we suddenly comes in, like you and I, we fellow travelers. But we, of course, we don't know the Japanese alphabet. How are we going to know? It's all mysterious and stuff like that. Um, so that's like a kind of a, a tame one, but still like, you know, for someone who obviously studies the Japanese alphabet, it's kind of jarring, right? Um, and then uh, there's other stuff, though, like there's this one bit, like uh, a bit earlier on, where she talks, first of all, like the musings and the stories often kind of like blend into each other. So first of all, there's a musing where she talks about a friend who is a tour guide um, in, I think, Tunisia. Um, but she says that when she has to give stories she about places, she often makes things up and she especially takes things from the Arabian Nights or the Thousand and One Nights, right? The stories of Shahrazad. And she says her friends tell these stories and often embellishes them and adds in her own experience and so on. And the tourists never notice these things. And then the very next story, um, the next long story, is a story about a sultan and it's called Harem. And it's just so like that image of you know the east as this sort of very like decadent and sexualized place right that that is so like kind of familiar to us and like it's so exotic and there's all the things you'd expect all the silks and the, the harem is actually in a labyrinth and it's very and and the, she talks about the winding passages and she also talks about like the vaginas i think it's the first or maybe the only time that the word vagina is used is in these like kind of eastern uh, Middle Eastern, I should say, uh, descriptions. And it's really like, I don't know. It's The thing is that she's obviously like kind of set the stage for this by saying that like she has a white friend who, who, who tells her own versions of these Eastern stories, you know. And she has a certain level of awareness of, you know, the fact that she's taking this exotic image and like kind of using it to make her own stories. But just because you're aware that what you're doing is pretty problematic and stereotypical, it doesn't mean that it's okay to do it, right? To everything she lent some Arab colour, holding forth on details of dress, cuisine, camel varietals. It's like she's talking about the friend there, right? Telling her stories and then she does the same thing herself. So of course, like as a intelligent reader, you're meant to go, ah, I see what you're doing. She must first announce herself to his two trusted guards, eunuchs, black as ebony, Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog being these like, you know, biblical barbarians. And it's like, ah, uh, and then on the next page, like, I don't even know if this is intentional or not, but there's someone who she describes as, like, wearing a saffron turban. And then a few sentences later, she refers to him as scarlet turban. And just the changing of colors from saffron to scarlet, which are both kind of, you know, you know, they're sexy colors, right? They're like exotic colors. They're not red and purple or whatever. It's like, I, I and, and the fact that they don't even retain that identity. They're just, oh, some some exotic color, you know what I mean? Like, it almost feels like she forgot that it was supposed to be one or the other, and or that it doesn't matter, actually, because these sort of fetishistic descriptions are completely interchangeable. Um, 
And yeah, the whole thing it didn't, I mean, it was actually a great story. That's the thing. It was written so well. Um, and I love that story, but all that like fetishizing stuff really didn't sit well with me. Another thing that she does to show that she's aware of what she's doing is she describes like Western, uh, like military coming to the East and she calls them like the barbarian hordes from the West with their, their light colored blue irises, you know, and like she, she tries to write in that same fetishistic language about um, Western soldiers coming over but you know again it's like you know just because you do like reverse racism doesn't like cancel out racism if that makes sense. Another criticism which I think is linked to the sort of very like grounded Western white liberal attitude uh, or identity of the narrator is uh, something that I, I, I really thought was well for formulated in a book review that I read on Goodreads, which I'll link below, where the, the writer referred to this book as a very 2000s pre-recessionary book. That was the word they used, pre-recessionary. And when I read that, I just thought, yes, that is it. That is, that's what was jarring. Um, this, this image of the writer is like talking about flights and airplanes and travels always like the world is opening up and becoming like more connected and you know internet and mobile phones and all this stuff it's so like kind of you know making us connected and losing our sense of identity and like we're spreading out we're becoming pilgrims we're diverse right and um, we're just taking planes from here to there airports are becoming more important than cities to live as living places you know and um all this kind of stuff uh, I mean, I don't think it was true in 2007 for most people. I think it was true for a lot of, uh, you know, like, well, like privileged baby boomers. But um, it definitely wasn't true and after the recession, right? Um, and so this book really kind of captures that feeling um, of globalization being this great positive thing, which, you know, a lot of people don't feel at the moment. And also of the world kind of you know, opening up in terms of like possibilities and connectivity and so on, um, rather than kind of closing down and becoming more insular um, as it is now. And there's like, I think like, and, and in that same review, the person said that uh, th that might have been one of the reasons why this book uh, did so well and won the, you know, got the acclaim and won the prizes that it did, you know, 10 years later, because there is, you know, now uh, a, a very specific type of person and mentality that wants to go back to that time before the crash, before all this, you know, xenophobia and nationalism uh, and, you know, and, and, and basically kind of revolutionary and democratic revolutionary um, attitudes, you know, that's like populism. That's the word I was looking for. Populism, right? Like they want to go back to when, you know, like things were all like airplanes were the most wonderful thing and we were all jet setting around and going on holidays everywhere. And I don't know, like it's got... A sort of nostalgic feeling to it now which of course is not the writer's fault right like she didn't predict any of these things that are going to happen but i do think that like this book would appeal very sp particularly to that kind of um liberal uh baby boomer mindset which is um you know sees 2007 as just like the best time whereas for a lot of people it wasn't obviously and that's like clear now or at least it should be clear now anyway so yeah that criticism and the orientalism one may seem totally different but basically like i do think that they're important and they're connected because the i the narrator of this book is very much like grounded in a specific identity um and and way of thinking which you know not everyone will get along with or agree with um and i didn't really and i think that not only does that make some of this not so exciting to read, but also it makes it um, kind of, again, like I said, hypocritical because of the whole like feeling of the book is travel and escape and moving around from place to place. So while it has that, you know, that sort of sense of that that broad reach, it also has a very specific and narrow kind of uh, limitation. And I think that's something that, you know, isn't really explored. That said, I do think that the voice, the writer's voice was also kind of annoying for me just because like, it reminded me of myself. Maybe as a privileged white guy, like the writer kind of reminded me of like, myself in some way. Um, but not just that, like some of the, write, the observations like um, are things that, you know, I might write in my own diary. Uh, like she, she sees like a, a mobile phone uh, ad, which says something like mobility is reality, I think was the quote. Um, and then like, that's just a whole section to itself. And I guess if I saw that, I would also kind of be struck by it and maybe tell a friend about it in an anecdotal way. Like lots of these bits are really anecdotal, but it's not that 
profound or interesting or worth being put in a book. It's like kind of I felt like I was being shown the most boring parts of my own head, if that makes sense. Although there were other bits where I felt kind of comforted because I was like, oh yeah, that's exactly how I think. Like there's this one bit where she's talking about being in the here and now. Um, and, you know, she's a great writer. So when she articulates stuff that you feel in, you know, beautiful language, then of course that's uh, moving, I guess. And that brings me to the main reason why I rated this as four stars, despite all the criticisms that I have of it, and despite all the sort of like problematic and hypocritical stuff that I think is in this book, um, I still gave it four stars because it's just damn good writing. Like she really wrote her socks off with this and the stories, especially uh, the fictional pieces, gave me images and characters that are going to stay with me. Uh, definitely, like probably forever, you know? Um, I mean, I don't know. I, I just read it, so it's fresh in my head. But some of the storytelling was just so good. And um, I talked to you before about the metaphors and so on. Um, it was so like well put together that I just kind of, I thought, how could I, whenever I read a book that like moves me, like really moves me, I have to give it at least four stars. Because for me, three stars on Goodreads is sort of like, take it or leave it. Like I enjoyed it but my life hasn't been like improved for reading the book. Whereas in this one, you know, despite all the problems, there were some really excellent pieces of fiction and, you know, my life was improved for reading those. So um, even though like most of the reviews that I read on Goodreads where the opinions kind of were like really the same as my own, those reviews were three stars. So really like, I think I probably grade a little bit higher than most people, but um, yeah, that's that's how I feel. I feel like for me, a four star read is one where I had some connection with uh, sus with some fiction that really, you know, Im improved my life in some way or another. And that, you know, this book did that. So that was Flights. And that was my long, convoluted, messy review of that book. I'm glad I finished it. It took me a while to finish. If you've read it, I'd love to hear what you thought about it. If it was overall positive, overall negative very strange mesh of the two as it was for me or or whatever just your thoughts on um on flights and yeah if you've read anything else by Tokarczuk then let me know because I want to I definitely want to read more by her um because the storytelling was so good I think that I would get on with something that she wrote which was just a straightforward story if she writes them like I presume most of her novels aren't these weird sort of encyclopedic encyclopedic writer journal type things so um, that's it. That's everything. Thank you so much for listening and see you in the next video. Bye bye.